Hello, everybody. It's Jade with the Octopus Literary, Literary Podcast again. This is our second real episode where, where we will be covering chapters four through six of John Scalzi's Old Man's War. Last week we covered chapters one, two, and three. This week we're covering four, five, and six and finishing what is called part one in the book. Um, so we're sort of cleaning up what's rest, what's left of what would be considered the first act of a three-act structure, uh, where we introduce our principal cast, we introduce the protagonist and the themes of the story, and I guess after this we're going to be getting into what is really the plot and the rising action of this book. Uh, but for now, we're sort of finishing up characterizing the people that we really need to know about, the CDF and John. Um, I should also mention that last week there was a discussion question, um, and nobody answered it, and that's because I didn't tell you that I would like to be reading the responses that I get to any of the discussion questions at the beginning of each podcast. So um, if you have an answer for the discussion question, please send it in or put it in the comments below on the YouTube video or put it in the Reddit thread, and I will read those comments at the beginning of next podcast or podcast after that for next week's question. So chapter four is about the rigorous testing that all of the old farts, as they're called, um, undergo in preparation for them receiving their new bodies. Um, they've told the CDF that they're interested in getting these new bodies and they have shown up but chapter four is about the actual process of undergoing the evaluation that they need for these new bodies to work. Um, and through this, we actually learn a lot about not only John, but the rest of the old farts and a lot about the CDF. Um, so at the beginning of chapter four, John is talking to his doctor, a guy named Dr. Russell. And um, the first thing that happens is Dr. Russell comments, you look like your dog just died. Um, as you remember, last week, the last thing that happened was John's roommate, died. John's roommate Leon, had a heart attack and died immediately before they were supposed to get a checkup. And um, so the you look like your dog just died comment tells us how John looks in reaction to this event. So John's not telling us, or John's not narrating, I feel like shit. I'm sad my roommate died. Um, in fact, he's just kind of going on with the things that he needs to do. But with the doctor telling us that the dog just died, well, that he looks like his dog just died, he's telling us that John still is carrying the weight of Leon's death around with him on his face. Um, so John tells the doctor, Dr. Russell, that his roommate died. And, um, and the doctor, Dr. Russell says, um, Leon Deke, I would have been working on him right after you. Bad timing. That, well, let's get off the schedule then. Let's get that off the schedule then. He tapped the PDA screen for a few seconds, smiled tightly when he was through. So he refers to Leon as that. Um, let's get that off the schedule. Um, and then he smiles tightly after removing him from the uh, after, after removing him from the schedule. So I have a few friends that have worked in retirement homes and hospitals, and they all say that th what happens to you when you work in these places is that you you become fairly accustomed or extremely accustomed to death. No matter how much you care about individual patients, you accept their deaths a lot more easily when you see people die a lot. So by Dr. Russell's reaction here, we can extrapolate that people die a lot on their first day in the CDF. It's a thing that happens all the time. Um, or we can guess that. And on the next page, Dr. Russell confirms this for us. Um, in this doctor's office, there's these two creches, and I really hope I'm 
and I was saying that correctly. There's these two crushes which are like things that the patients can lay in while um, while the evaluation is being performed. Um, based on the fact that there's two, we can pretty easily guess that this will be used for the body transfer later. So it's a nice bit of foreshadowing. And even if you don't pick up that it's for a body transfer, you are, it, it's, it's getting your mind going and wondering what it's for. So yeah, every detail is used to either tell us something or tell us we need to be thinking about something. And that's called good writing. Um, so then the doctor starts the actual evaluation of John's health. And John reacts to this the way he would react to a normal doctor's appointment. But at every turn, the doctor is telling him, no, you don't need to take your clothes off or you need to lay in this thing. And John is kind of weirded out by everything. He does what Dr. Russell asks him, but um, he says that this appointment feels creepy. And what this tells us as readers is that in the future, we don't know how far into the future this book takes place, but this is not what doctor's appointments are like. And that means these medical devices are um, alien technology. They are something that doesn't exist on Earth, so John, an Earthling, has never used them. Um, so the crash that John is laying in uh, scans him, and it takes almost zero time, so it's a clear improvement over human technology on Earth, and, um, and Dr. Russell tells John that he has testicular cancer. Um, and a beat that we keep getting over and over again is that Dr. Russell has, like, no bedside manner to speak of, or rather, he has a, a very, he, he puts no effort into his bedside manner. Um, he makes a little joke about the fact that John has testicular cancer in order to tell him that he has testicular cancer. Um, he doesn't even think about the fact that John doesn't know that he's going to be getting a new body. Um, and it really gives the impression that the CDF goes through thousands upon thousands of recruits. Um, in both this and the appointment that John has with him later in the same chapter. Um, Dr. Russell is rushing John along. He has 15 minutes for each patient. He doesn't bother to refer to them by their names other than when they first come in because he probably doesn't care about knowing their names. Um, and it just, it gives the impression that this is like a, like a cruise ship, right? You go in um, and there's stuff for you to do but um, it's, it's rather, dis uh, you, you are close to the other passengers, but you're not close to the staff, right? Um, this is not the doctor that knows your body. This is a medic. Um, I mean, he's a doctor, but he's not someone who you're going to get to know. And he doesn't care to. Um, so John gets really annoyed at the fact that Dr. Russell doesn't have doesn't put any effort into his bedside manner. Um, his narration changes to a very annoyed tone of voice. He says, it was the first time I'd ever had my own package waved in front of my face. And it just gives, it gives you this sense of annoyance. And then um, he actually confronts Dr. Russell and says that most doctors would have found a more tactful way to break the news that he has testicular cancer. So we learn from this that one, um, this is the kind of thing that pisses off John, um, not caring about people as you do your job. But also, it shows that John has become a little bit more confrontational as the story has gone, gone on. You remember just yesterday, he um, was unable to tell Leon that he didn't want to talk about um, the war. He was just doormatting, or being a doormat. Um, where today he's actually standing up to Dr. Russell when he's unhappy with the service he's being provided. 
um, which shows that he's kind of come out of his shell a little bit, but also that he has less patience. His roommate just died, um, and he's in a new environment. Dr. Russell tries to make John feel secure with the information that he has testicular cancer, or, or, or tries to make him feel not worried without telling him that he is getting a new body, um, which doesn't really work. Uh, so it made me wonder, why does the CDF even tell them that they have stuff like testicular cancer, if they're just going to get body new bodies in a couple of days? Um, and the conclusion that I came to is, I don't know why they tell them, but it does paint the CDF in a much more positive light than I was thinking they would be painted last week. Um, if you saw last week's episode, you saw that I was extremely skeptical skeptical of the CEF. They're keeping secrets from everybody at every turn. Whereas here, they're, they're being open with the recruits about stuff that they don't necessarily need to know. John's not going to have this body four days from now. Why does he need to know the that he has testicular cancer? He doesn't, but the fact that they tell him and are open with him is reassuring to me. Now that now that he's part of the group, he's in, I guess. Um, and and that that makes me feel better. And and I'm sh and it should make the recruits feel better too under other circumstances. Um so then then we have the first time Dr. Russell uses the phrase comprehensive physical overhaul and he uses this exact phrasing like four times instead of just saying you're getting a new body hush um so they do try to keep this under wraps for as long as possible um so i'm not really sure why but we'll probably this will probably come up later um so but dr russell tells um tells john that in the case that there's an actual medical issue, they will fix the person well enough that they will survive for the next couple of days and then just wait until they get their comprehensive physical overhaul. So that shows us that the CDF is putting in, putting in the effort on the individual basis for the recruits. Um, so then, um, so, so John has been John has been pretty afraid of this arm with a cup on it that is in the crèche. Um, it's like a cap that is put down onto the onto the patient's head, um, and he's been wary of this thing the whole time. And um, it's placed on his head, and this is the point when it, it it's placed on his head, and he gets really nervous. And this is the point when I actually started to buy into the Dr. Russell sucks um, train that John got on, um, because if your patient is behaving, if you if your patient is clearly distressed over something, and you don't say anything about it, you don't do anything about it, you just stick the arm cup onto their head, it shows that you have some amount of, you, you don't care what their experience is and you're rather distant from the fact that you are treating an actual human um so yeah what happens next is these sensors are implanted into john's head and the sensors are implanted into everybody's head but right now it's john and it is effectively the most painful thing that john has ever experienced and because the the sensors are connected to each other and it the, each sensor there's like 20,000 of them connecting to each other is extremely painful for him and Dr. Russell appears to give exactly zero shits about the fact that he's effectively watching someone being tortured in front of him um which just pays into this idea of Dr. Russell as like a technician who has to do the exact same procedure like 50 times a day and little variations like this is a new person just don't matter to him at all. Um, I also want to talk about the comedic timing that um, 
that Scalzi uses, and he uses this exact, um, he uses this exact technique repeatedly, and the first use in this section is with, um, is with John saying that the, is, is with John asking Dr. Russell whether the sensors will hurt, and, um, and then it turns out that it does hurt, but we're going to, we're going to get back to this at a later time in this chapter. Um, but yeah, I just want to talk about how Scalzi constructs a joke so that it is funny to a reader instead of a listener as, as a comedian would. Um, so what happens next is we switch back over to, we skip ahead to when John is hanging out with the rest of the elderly recruits whom Harry has named the old farts. And I noticed when I was first reading this that everyone on this ship could be deemed, and well, all the recruits anyway, could be deemed an old fart. So this doesn't say anything about the particular group that they are in. But also, it seems like these people would be completely open to anyone else joining their little clique, so it doesn't doesn't matter. They're not the uh, group of people consisting of these seven names. Um, anyone could could conceivably join. They're just open to anybody and they've named themselves the old farts. Um, so um, Harry attempts to uh, start a food fight with the next table over at lunchtime and Thomas tells Harry that they cannot do that because any food that they throw, they will not get to eat. And I just wanted to talk about the way that Scalzi develops or introduces characters. So there's a lot of old farts, and we don't see particularly a lot of them individually. Um, there's only so much you can do with seven characters in, like, 60 pages. Um, especially when one of them is far more important than the other six. Um, but Scalzi uses a very limited number of lines to give each of the old farts a very distinct personality. Um, so if you've ever seen Firefly, and even if you hadn't, um, I was actually working on a short, I was working on a writing project last year and I wanted to know more about how to introduce characters such that the audience becomes familiar with them quickly. Um, in Firefly specifically, the way they introduce this colorful cast of characters to you is by making each of their interactions and lines extremely characterful as like as much as possible for the first several episodes as you don't know who these people are. Some of the more subtle characterization doesn't come until way later because, for example, there's a character named Jane in Firefly who is like the, the heavy, um, he's, he's the fighter of the group. Uh, he's responsible for protecting the ship. And over and over and over again in the first several episodes, you just get him talking about his guns, him talking about hurting people, him talking about protecting the ship, just hammering this idea into your head of what is Jane's job in the crew? He is the guy with guns. Um, and then later on, we develop that he has other qualities other than man with gun. Um, but for the first several episodes, because you're not, you're not familiar with these people, we have to hammer in their one or two most significant personality tra traits over and over again. And it allows you to, it allows the audience to become familiar with them quickly and actually care so that their later character development is actually interesting to you. Um, so Scalzi does much the same thing here. He gives them each, like, two character traits, maybe three, if you don't count their gender and their name. Um, 
and each each character has a char a primary character trait and a flaw that doesn't keep them from being weird. Um, so the first thing we find out about John is that he is kind and loving and caring a person, but his major flaw is that he is lonely. Um, so his primary character trait is extremely endearing to the audience, and his flaw isn't something that alien alienates us from him. We're not going to hate somebody because they're lonely. Um, so then we get Jesse. Um, Jesse's primary character trait is she's adventurous. She wants to explore the galaxy. But her major flaw is that she's a shut-in and she hasn't experienced m most of the world. Um, her primary character trait is endearing and her flaw is non-alienating. Um, Harry is a physics geek and that's it, most of his lines are about how much he likes physics or how much he's interested in physics. Um, he's also the group leader, um, and we'll talk more about that later. But his flaw is that he has a cynical streak and a dark sense of humor. This is not something that most audiences would be alienated by. Um, so his flaw is something that doesn't, that is not a flaw to an audience. Um, Thomas um, is, Thomas is a doctor, but his primary character trait is that he likes food. He's endearing. Everybody likes food. Um, and his flaw is that he's willing to pull ultimately harmless pranks to get food. So while this annoys the other characters, it doesn't annoy us, the audience, because we aren't actually being deprived of food. Um, so endearing with a flaw that doesn't make him not endearing. And that's basically how, um, that's basically how Scalzi develops or conceptualizes characters that we are supposed to be endeared to. Um, other tertiary characters like Dr. Russell, whom it doesn't matter that we care about them, their flaws are more serious. But for the old farts, their flaws are not serious. Um, so, um, after this, I, I noticed that, uh, Thomas, every, every time Thomas says something, uh, Susan, Susan says something mean, specifically to Thomas. Um, at this point, I thought that Susan was probably Thomas's wife. Um, I was later proven wrong, but, um, it's just something that was, that she consistently is always responding to Thomas, specifically. So then each of the old farts share what medical issue they found out that they had this morning at the, um... So then each of the old farts shares what their medical issue is that they found out that they had this morning at their checkup. Um, and literally all of them have something wrong. Um, John has a, I almost said John has ovarian cancer, cancer. John has testicular cancer. Uh, both of the, uh, both Jesse and Maggie have um, ovarian cysts. Susan get, doesn't get to say what she has, but it seems like everybody has something wrong with them. And that just kind of hammers in the idea that it is a good thing that they came here because otherwise most of them would be dying. Um, Harry has can Harry also has lung cancer. Alan has rheumatoid arthritis, which isn't lethal, but it is going to make him miserable, just progressively more miserable. Um, ovarian cysts aren't lethal either, but they will, but they will cause you great pain, and you have to have surgery. So it shows that their um, their decision to come here was was justified. So, skipping ahead a little bit, um, the, John makes a little, not joke per se, but he uses the idiom, um, the first set of sensors nearly killed me from the pain, and Alan responds, speaking of which, I hear you've lost your roommate this morning, are you okay? So this tells us two things about Alan. One, 
but he cares enough to ask John about how he's doing with the new Leon. But two, saying, the first set nearly killed me. Speaking of which, your roommate died is just the most socially horrible way to approach that. Like, we, we see someone later in this section who is worse socially than Alan here, but they were doing it on purpose. Anyway, um, this is hilarious in book form, but in real life, that's awful. Um, so we learn a little something about Alan here. Um, so then John says that he is okay with the fact that, well, not okay with the fact that Leon died, but he is doing okay. Um, but he does blame himself for not getting Leon up to go to breakfast. And he says that, um, that that might have saved his life, which is what I said last episode, but that was me reading this as a third party for John to be thinking this is, is just sad. So then Thomas says, don't kick yourself about it. There's no way you could have known. People just die. So here's another beat about Thomas being, he was a doctor, um, but we're paralleling Thomas to Dr. Russell, the doctor we saw this morning, who is extremely um, blasé about people's deaths. And Thomas is saying, you know, people just die as sh he's telling us effectively how Dr. Russell feels about Leon's death and about how, and, and about the recruits in general, um, because there's that parallel between Thomas and Dr. Russell of them both being doctors. But Thomas can speak for Dr. Russell in that regard. He's a surrogate for him in this scene. Um, a little... I just pulled this out. There's a little point in this conversation where Harry throws a piece of bread at Susan. Um, nothing deep here, but it shows how familiar these guys have become in, what, 24 hours? Less than 24 hours? Um, they've lost a member of their group. Uh, they've all experienced traumatic pain from having these sensors implanted in their brain. Um, and now they are close enough that they throw bread at each other. Um, also, after this, Susan makes another just horrid joke at Leon's expense. Leon, a, a person whom she never met. Um, he might have been horrible, but Susan did not know that. She's extremely blunt, mean. Crass is the wrong word, but she's, um, she's... She always jumps to the mean thing to say. Um, she never goes overboard, but she almost never says anything nice. Um, so, yeah, they talk about Leon a little bit more, and it appears that I was wrong last week. This did not destroy the mood for the old farts. It only destroyed John's mood. John is the only one who gives a flying crap about Leon. So then Harry and John move on to some um, evaluations which are supposed to record how their brain processes when they have to solve certain problems. Uh, the first one is a the first one is a math and language test. Um, and at this point I started to really, really wonder what John did for a living. We know what almost everybody else did for a living, but we don't know what John did. So far, we know he's good with people, but not so good that he had to have been like a psychologist. We learn here that he's not good with language or math. What was his job? Um, then they do a white square test where you look at a you look at a screen and there's a white square and you have to follow it, and then slowly other squares pop up. And um, you have to watch them move around, and there's no reason thematically for me to pull this out. I just wanted to say, if you don't have glasses, um, this sucks. I, I mean, this is a test that people who wear glasses have to do, and it's just 
just the worst. I hate this stuff so much, so I related a lot to Harry and John complaining about it because this test is horrible. Um, so they move on to another test where John has to make a house out of blocks and John makes a little joke and for the first time, for the first time, the colonial, the person who is with them actually responds to one of John's jokes. So it's showing sort of how John, John has become more aggressive, but also he's bec he's becoming closer. He's aligning sort of with the colonial def defense force. Um, so they ask him to build a house out of blocks and he does it and he doesn't complain. Um, so I put, maybe he was a contractor of some kind. Um, he's good at working with people, uh, but not that good. So he, he works with clients and, um, you know, maybe other contractors. Um, he's not particularly good at math or language, but he can build stuff with his hands. I don't know. That's my guess. Uh, the last line of this section is I learned to stop wondering why and just do what they told me. So on the... John stops wondering why and does what the CDF tells him. Watch 2K20. Uh, this is this is important. Um, then it moves on to a test where the um, where a CDF person tries to make John angry um, to test what happens when he gets angry and how his brain responds. And the way they introduce this section is. A little later in the afternoon, I got pissed off. And I like that phrasing a lot on a reread because it's like saying, I got my car washed or I got laid, right? I got pissed off is, in this case, someone doing something to John. Um, but you don't read it that way the first time. So on a reread, it's it's clever. Um, so, so in order to, in order to piss him off, the, the person who is administering this test says about John's wife, gotta love a stroke. He said, damn, your brain's skull pudding. Just like that. Good that she didn't survive. She'd be this fat, bedridden turnip, you know. You just have to feed her through a straw or something. He made slurping noises. At this point, I just about lost it. Um, I was so mad, but it's, it's part of a test. And and I, j I just really liked that line. Um, imagine having this job of having to come up with like the worst possible thing that you could say about somebody's dead, dead spouse. Anyway, so John gets extremely irritated here. Like he, this is the part where he is almost moved to violence. Um, and, and the the um the test is to see what whether john will be moved to violence and we find out that there are other people so even even though john seriously contemplates hitting this guy there are other people who do actually hit him um but john doesn't so that tells us that john is different than those people in that regard um i made a little prediction that if, if anybody out of the old parts actually hit the guy probably susan because not that Susan can't control herself, but she habitually doesn't. Um, so she would probably be more open to making the leap from cutting remarks to extremely cutting remarks or fish slapping him. Um, so if we ever find that out, we probably won't. But I'm guessing it would be Susan. Um, so... Um, we also find out definitively that the thing that would piss off John most is a comment disrespecting someone he cares about. Um, I feel like he would also be nearly as angry piss uh, disrespecting someone he doesn't care about. Um, but this is, this is the thing that is um, scientifically John's pet peeve. And it seems like a pretty generic pet peeve, but when we find out later what some of the other group's pet peeves are, it shows that this is a very individual peeve. Um, 
And then, then it says he moves on to the next test, which is a very nice young lady who happened to be completely naked, wanted me to tell her anything I could possibly remember about my seventh birthday party. Now, on first read-through, I thought that this was to see how focused he can be under extremely distracting circumstances. But on the second read-through, after reading what the recruits do with their new bodies, um, I found I saw this as another point towards the CDF because this is this test is effectively mapping out how the recruits respond to sexual stimuli so that they can respond the same way to sexual stimuli in the future. Um, because they're going to be in the military, the CDF chemically castrated them and it would have been fine um, from their perspective. But the fact that they are not doing that for the effectively just the happiness of the recruits is nice. Yeah. Um. Then we we move on to a um, we mo we we find out that the next test was um, watching watching a video of intestinal surgery to see how each of the recruits responds to gore. Um, and Thomas has no problem with it because he's a doctor. Everybody else is various shades of green from watching this. Uh, various shades of green. Um, so then we get this section. Um, Did anyone else get the naked woman asking about your childhood? I asked. I got a man, Susan says. So this is the point where you realize, oh, each person got someone of the opposite sex. And as you, as you, the human reader, are reading, you are probably consciously or subconsciously, for me it was consciously, looking to see whether anybody gets a, um, whether anybody got someone of the same sex so that you can speculate as to whether they're gay. Um, so we get, did anyone else get a na get the naked woman asking you about your childhood? I asked. I got a man, Susan said. Woman. Man. Woman. Man, said Alan. We all looked at him. What? Alan said. I'm gay. So this is what I was talking about earlier, about comedic timing that John Scalzi uses. When we are reading, there is no way to enforce how quickly we read. So we have to have sentences that pad out, sentences or phrasing that pad out the rhythm of what we're reading so that the comedic beat lands with proper timing. So, man, said Alan, we all looked at him. So there's a pause there. And then what, Alan said, another small pause, I'm gay. And that's how the punchline is delivered. Um, and it works perfectly. Um, Scalzi uses about 10-15 jokes in these three chapters, and most all of them land beautifully because he uses this formula of someone says something, a little bit of padding, other, other lines that are still relevant and informative, but padding before the punchline, which also has padding in it so that the timing is delivered correctly. Um, good writing, again. Um, so then we find out that the thing that pissed off Thomas most was the guy said the Cubs ought to have been demoted to the minor leagues after they went two centuries without a World Series championship. So at first I thought this was kind of a throwaway line, but we've noticed with Scalzi that everything matters that he says, right? Or everything matters that he writes. Um, everything matters to the characters. So at this point, I kind of went down a rabbit, a rabbit hole. Thomas has not been shown to be a great doctor. Um, in fact, he seems to have probably been a bad doctor. We drew some parallels from him to Dr. Russell, uh, Dr. Russell being a bad doctor. Thomas has a miserable disposition towards others when talking about their health. Um, he doesn't seem concerned with other people's happiness, not happiness, he doesn't seem comfortable with other people 
He doesn't seem concerned with other people's comfort. Um, he seems entirely desensitized to the profession of doctoring. Um, and so when he said the Cubs ought to have been demoted to the minor leagues after they went two centuries without a World Series championship, I was kind of thinking that Thomas probably related, if, if I'm right and Thomas was not a good doctor, he probably related to the Cubs here. If he was a bad doctor, people were probably telling him that he ought to not be a doctor or that he ought to scale back his practice and he wouldn't want to do that. Um, so him being insulted by the Cubs being demoted to the minor leagues is him being insulted by him being demoted from having his own practice. And maybe this is a huge reach, but from what I've seen, I, I think this is actually pretty consistent with, with, with what we've seen of, Tom's, of Thomas's character. Um, then they do some, the, the following day they do, um, physical tests, um, not to see how strong they are, but to see how they do certain things. We find out that John likes swimming. I'm calling out every little bit we learn about John because he doesn't like to talk about himself. Most of what we find out about him is told to us by somebody else. Um, so John likes swimming. Um. None of, none of the exercises that they do ever are exhausting to the recruits. Um, they're just things that they're watching them do. Um, later, John refers to the old farts as the old farts, so the name actually sticks, um, which is just cute. Um, Harry says that he thinks that they're learning their hand-eye hand coordination, timing and precision. But this is something that is improved by their new bodies later. So I think it's actually just evaluating what kinds, how the, how the recruits process motion and what kind of things they enjoy. I don't even think they need to be evaluating their hand-eye coordination. Um, at this point, Thomas calls Harry flabby. Um, another beat of Thomas not being particularly sensitive. Not that he needs to be sensitive all the time. I'm just saying that he doesn't act like the ideal doctor paragon. Um, the old farts find out the following day they will have concluding physical improvements, um, which is another just vague, vague reference to them getting new bodies. Um, and since they have the rest of the day off, Harry takes them to see to see the actual warp from their solar system, our solar system, to the one they're going to. Um, he said that he actually asked one of the colonial folks where they could go see it. And um, this is some really interesting characterization for Harry because if you think about it, he was a high school physics teacher. What was his job day in and day out? Finding fun activities for that will get people excited about science or will entertain people um, in a way that is mentally stimulating. So he has become the leader of this group and he finds these activities because that's who he has been for at least the last 30 years. Um, so consistent characterization. Um, at the same time, uh, Jesse jokes that if they get in trouble, they're, they'll get blown out of the airlock, and Harry says that that would be a waste of perfectly good air. So he's still consistently a little bit cynical with a little bit of a dark humor streak. Um, Thomas jokes that he can only get to know people, um, by knowing about the behavior of their lower intestine. Um, like I said, hammering in the same traits over and over and over again until you get it. Um, so then we actually finally, finally get a little bit of background for Alan. And um, I thought this was a little weird at the time, but it makes a lot of sense why we're doing this later, which is that Alan is the only person that Harry, not Harry, John 
is actually going to be seen from this point on in the book, um, or at least for the next while, because Alan is the person who is assigned to go to the same destination as he is. So we're getting some pretty deep characterization of Alan because we're going to need it. So it turns out that he made a serious, um, a, a serious invention for a naval company um, that made him just a whole lot of money. And he tried to spend a lot of the money and make his life cushy, but it, it didn't satisfy him. And he ended up leaving Earth and all of his riches behind. Um, he has no children, um, or at least none that we know of, um, and he hasn't talked about any husband or anything. Um, so that is why, you know, last week we found out that Alan did not go to see the, um, see them leaving Earth. He, he doesn't have anything on Earth to look back on, but he says he has been interested in astronomy since he was a child. And he wanted to be here to see them leave their constellations behind as they warp to another solar system where the constellations will be different. Um, and here, Alan gets quite emotional and Susan actually supports him. So this is what I was talking about earlier that even though Susan's mean all the time, she does have a, she, she does have like a, a, a sense of, of when to be nice to people. Um, so they, they leave the solar system, um, and Harry says, if any of us were still thinking Earth was the center of the human universe, now would be an excellent time to revise that theory, because they see this huge sp space station with ships bustling in and out, uh, and this, this space station is several times larger than any of the space stations near Earth. Uh, so the implication is that this place that they've come to, this space station, is the center of the human universe. Um, this is where humans do their trade and their military. It is it was the center of their military. Um, it's not Earth anymore. Um, so um, the following morning, John is woken up at 545 um, when they told him that they were going that he was going to have something at six and that he was um he had set an alarm to wake up at six which struck me as there are there are programs and facilities that they have on this ship that are supposed to make the overall happiness of the recruits raise but they don't have but they're not concerned with the individual the happiness of the individual recruits um, do most recruits like waffles? Yeah, all right, let's add waffles. But does John want to be woken up at 5.45? Doesn't matter. Um, again, thousands upon thousands of people come through this. In fact, there are a thousand people in this batch of recruits today. Um, so John is called back to the doctor's office with Dr. Russell for his um, comprehensive physical overhaul, as Dr. Russell called it. And um, he actually threatens violence against Dr. Russell, uh, which shows us that he has been, he has been changed by the last couple of days. Would, would John of five days ago have done this? No, he wouldn't, um, but he does now. Um, he gets into the crèche and he's bolted in. Um, it gives us the feeling of a coffin. This is where his, this is his body's final resting place, effectively. And, um, at this point, if you haven't figured out, they're getting a body transplant. You figure it out right now. Um, Interestingly, John says he didn't mind that the door to the crash is being bolted down. I would have lost it <laughs> if I didn't know that what was going on. Even if I did know what was going on. Yeah, anyway. Um, just characterization for John. Um, so then John says, interestingly, if I knew I was going to be treated like a preschooler, 
I probably wouldn't have signed up. This is fascinating. What do you think the military is if it's not being told what to do every hour of every day? Um, which under John's definition is being treated like a preschooler. So then we get some absolutely fascinating examination of human consciousness by Scalzi. Um, I'm sure most of you have heard of the Star Trek transporter problem, but if you haven't heard of it, I'm going to explain it now. So there is speculation in every corner of sci-fi that in the future we will be able to extend our lives by transferring our consciousness into new bodies. Um, and for a lot of people, this freaks us out. And I say us because for me, this freaks me out. Because imagine you have a, a sheet of paper um, and you copy this sheet of paper. So now you have the original and a copy. And instead of having you know pencil on paper, it's ink slightly pixelized on paper. Um, it's a little bit different, but even if it's completely identical in every way, you still have the original and then you have the copy. And if you, if you delete, if you, if you burn the original, you still have the copy with all of the original information completely intact. And to outsiders, it looks the same, but it doesn't change the fact that the original was destroyed. So if you clone yourself, you do not get to live forever. There is a clone of you that continues to live, but the original dies. Um, the original is dead and the original is you. Um, so while you get to have the satisfaction of knowing that something like you is still influencing the earth, um, your consciousness still cease to ceases to exist. And that is the problem that is faced by sci-fi writers everywhere and by John here. Um, so the, the common discussion of this says that consciousness is a continual stream. And if anything breaks that stream, you die. Um, so if you, if you clone somebody, shut down one, shut down the original clone and then wake up the other clone, there's a death there because there's a separation in the consciousness. The way, the way they actually get around this here is by causing John's consciousness to exist in both bodies at once and then removing it from the one. And there is no practical reason for the CDF to do this. Um, they have all the information on John's brain. They have, they could probably completely recreate his consciousness from scratch if they wanted to. But it speaks to the legitimacy of the CDF's promises that they, well, it, it, it completely verifies the legitimacy of the CDF's promises that they go the extra several miles to ensure that John's consciousness, the original John, is placed into the next body and he live and so that he can continue to live. Um, what happens here is that Dr. Russell explains that the body is old and that he can't they can't fix it. They can't just continually repair it. Um, they have to throw away his body and they will be preserving his consciousness, but they're not going to keep, um, they're not going to keep the old body just to keep shit of feces in it. They're just going to throw it in the trash and get a new one. So that's the end of chapter four. So if chapter four was all about the information that the CDF needs to know to be able to create John's new body and the rest of their bodies, Chapter five is about what the actual bodies are like. Um, and there's more of this in chapter six, but we get a lot of the introductory, most literal information in chapter five. Um, so in a wheelchair, the CDF medics bring in 
a younger version of John, a 20-year-old version of John. Um, this is a heavily modified version of him. It's, for, for starters, it has green skin, um, and it has a variety of other um, improvements that we'll get to later. But the point is, they cloned him 10 years ago when he first submitted his interest form, and they've been growing this clone um, for the last 10 years, and now he is, and now John can board this body. Um, so my question is, what do they, what do they do with the clones of people who decide not to go or who die? Um, do they become humanoid robots? Do they, are, are clones so cheap that they just throw them away? Um, I think we will find out, but probably in a later book. We find out that the, that John's consciousness will be duplicated over into the other body and then severed from his old body so that he will have a continual stream of consciousness um, and thus be able to survive the transfer. Um, now, something interesting is Dr. Russell mentions that the guy before John screamed like a pig and fainted and we had to transfer him over unconscious. Um, this would be a huge HIPAA violation in, on Earth. Uh, you would not be able to say the person before you, I mean, John could probably easily find out who that was, um, fainted. That's just patient privacy. Um, so we're not on Earth anymore. Um, then um, they put uh, the cap back on John's head so that they can broadcast his consciousness over to the other body. But uh, the other body, the new body, the green body, does not need a cap. And um, Dr. Russell says this is because the body is heavily modified. Um, and what you should take from this, audience, is that the CDF is able to monitor John's brain function and thoughts at all times. Um, <clears throat> they're able to beam information into this brain. They are able to beam information out of this brain. Um, it's, it seems like John's okay with it, but it doesn't change the fact that this is what they're doing. Um, so, uh, John asks if the procedure ever fails, and Dr. Russell says you would ask that question, as in, Dr. Russell is able to see on his little PDA that he, uh, he would ask that, and he tells, he tells him that the only person who ever failed the transfer was a person who had a, a, a woman who had a massive stroke during the transfer. And this is probably reassuring to most other people who undergo this procedure because they probably don't know someone who died of a sudden and massive stroke. Um, and so it seems like something distant and of a tiny chance. Um, but for John, Dr. Russell really should have just said a woman died suddenly during the procedure because you know, John is intimately familiar with someone dying in front of him suddenly after, while looking for the vanilla. So we find out that Dr. Russell has actually transferred twice. He, he transferred to a green body, so he was part of the active fighting military, and then he transferred back into a regular human skin color body so that he can be a doctor, but he's no longer a part of them. Um, so he is one of the people that, that did that. So those people exist. Um, so he asks John if he's ready to begin. And uh, John says, hell no, I'm not ready. I'm so scared my bowels are about to cut out. Then let, me re then let me rephrase, Dr. Russell said. Are you ready to get it over with? This is the only thing Dr. Russell ever says that is like good and empathetic bedside manner. So I assume one of the previous recruits said, I'm ready to get this over with, and he's been copying it. Um, that's my assumption. Um, then John looks at the body that he's about to be transferred into and says, It looked like I did so long ago. Better than I did, actually. I wasn't the most athletic young adult on the block. This version of me looked like he was muscled like a competitive swimmer, and it had a great head of hair. I couldn't even imagine being in that body. So this is one final beat of John being 
just beaten down by his situation of his failing health and stuff. Um, he, again, he's the frog that has been boiled. Things have been getting, his body is just degrading over time. Um, and at this point he couldn't even imagine being in a young and healthy body. Um, so then Dr. Russell initiates the transfer and um, we get some really cool um, formatting for this page. And if you were reading the audio audiobook, I'm, I'm not sure how they got this across. And I would actually like to listen to the audiobook to hear how this was communicated. But um, the John's memories start flashing through his head. And he, um, and he describes what's going on in these crazy formatting. So the, f the first line is like tabbed in four times. There's stuff italicized. There's stuff um, cascading down, um, the letters cascading down. Um, there's stuff in parentheses. And it, it gives the impression of a person's brain just being put through a blender, which is exactly what it's supposed to communicate. So um, if if this was used more than once in this whole book, it would probably drive me nuts. But the, but the fact that it's used here puts massive emphasis on this transfer. Um, it shows just how traumatic is the wrong word, but dramatic might be. Just how dramatic this change is. Um, <clears throat> so he says that uh, all the memories he ever had hit me in the face like a runaway brick wall. And he describes these memories, but they're all of Kathy. Um, he says these are all the all the memories I ever had, but they're, it's their wedding. It's Kathy dying. And, um, and the thing is, if John lost memories in this transfer, if he lost any bit of himself, he still remembers and loves his wife. And for John, that's probably enough. Um, that's still the core of who he is. Um, that has been retained. So, from his perspective and from mine, this is a successful body transfer. Um, so he sees himself... He sees himself twice. He sees him looking from his new body's eyes to his old body's eyes and from his old body's eyes to his new body's eyes and he's in two places and um and then dr russell severs the connection to the old body and it says the old me i can tell because i'm no longer staring at the new me anymore i'm looking at the old me and it stares at me like it knows something truly strange has just happened and then it, the stare seems to say i'm no longer me and then it closes his eyes and this is what convinced me that the doctor was telling the truth, that this is an actual consciousness transfer. Because I think we know enough John, about John by now that we can say, we can be pretty confident that if there were two Johns and the original John was left in his old body, that John would lose his shit, right? He would yell and beat against the inside of the coffin or say something snappy if he, if he thought that he was about to die, but, um, but the body sagging and saying, I'm no longer needed, that's just, that's just John empathizing with that corpse. Um, there's nothing in there. So, yeah, good science. Um, or rather, good science in the future. I'm not saying that's how things will work in our future, but, um, I'm glad that scientists were able to perfect this. Um, <clears throat> So when Dr. Russell asks him his, his full name, he has to he has to think about it for a second, and then he says it's John Nicholas Perry. So this is this is how we find out the rest of John's full name. Um, we didn't know that he even had a middle name, let alone that it's Nicholas. And it it's showing that he it's emphasizing to us that this is really John. Nothing he has he may have a different body, but his soul is, is still there. Um, it's still the same person. Um, so he gets understandably very excited about his new, um, his new body. He starts jumping around. 
um, but he's still sentimentally attached to his old body and he asks about it and Dr. Russell says they are going to store it in the short term um, but it's implied they're going to get rid of it for the long term. Um, uh, and right before he leaves the doctor's office, um, John goes and retrieves his ring, his wedding ring from the old body. Um, he leaves everything else, not that there was anything else he was wearing that he really wanted, but um, it shows his consciousness has been transferred over. Um, well, his perspective has, but also he is he is hanging on to himself as he goes into this new life. He is he is hanging on to the core of his being and continuing to wear it on his hand. Um, as we establish that his, his relationship with Kathy is all of the memories that are important to him, and he's going to continue to hang on to those. Um, so then, then John reads this brochure, and this brochure is comedically incredible. Um, now, I'm, I'm sure for some people this is not very funny, it's just informative, but to me, gratuitous uses of trademarks and ridiculous um, trademark names are the pinnacle of comedy. Um, the TM symbol is used at least 40 times in these two pages, and it's hysterical. Um, your new skin, and in parentheses, Chloroderm in camel case with TM in the top. This this had me wheezing. Um, so we find out that um, we find out that his new skin is green because he's got chlorophyll in his skin. And I just made a note when I was reading. It says, "So he'll always be green." Sick, and I put like four exclamation marks. This is really cool. Um, so, yeah, it's different, but it's still a cool body that somebody would want to have. Um, so his green is, he says it's still like a pleasant color. Um, it's not garish. Um, so his, his blood has been replaced with something that carries more oxygen. Um, his skin has chlorophyll in it so that he can gain some energy from the sun. Um, his eyes, I'm sorry, patented cat's eye TM technology, um, is, is improved. Uh, his uncommon sense TM, uh, is sense enhancements that have been incorporated. Um, there's a hard arm technologies that make his, um, muscles better. And, um, but most importantly is the brain pal trademark. Um, which is a thing that's been implanted into his brain that is effectively a Google Assistant, but better. Um, and he, he can interact with this using only his brain, and it beams information directly into his brain. Um, this is probably the primary reason why he did not have to... This is probably how his consciousness was beamed into his brain. Um, because of whatever interfaces, whatever interface that the brain pal is already using. Um, so yeah, that is that is how the bodies were improved. It says that genetic information was used from other species. This is aliens. This we're not using actual cats. It's it's aliens. Um, later on, Jesse and John will talk about whether they have cat DNA. They don't. It's aliens. Um, the, and no, we didn't say that it's aliens, I'm just telling you that I've, I've read a book before. So, yeah. Um, his body is known as the Hercules model, so um, that's a cute name because Hercules is a figure known for his strength and his adventures all over the galaxy. I mean Earth. All over the Earth. Yeah. Um, so it, it's, it's a good name. It says that they all have a model number for maintenance purposes. It says, don't worry, you can still use your given name for everyday purposes. There's an exclamation mark after that. Um, like, thanks? Thanks, I get to still use my real name? Thanks for your permission, I guess. Um, 
it gives a little bit of a sense of what we find out later, which is that this body doesn't actually belong to John. After he leaves the, after he leaves the CDF, he will be um, given another regular human body. So he's effectively renting this as long as he's in the military. And it's cool, but he doesn't get to keep it. Um, it says that this new body will remain in top condition as long as you operate it, so it doesn't get aged. Um, and that each, um, each of this model is sterile, um, but it says other related functionality remains intact. I put a little joke here the first time I read it um, in the margins. I said, um, you know, this means they can still have sex. And I was, I was kind of kidding, but no, by the end of this chapter, all of the recruits are banging each other. So I thought I was being a little bit clever there. I wasn't. Um, Uh, then it's, in, in the brochure still, it says, I'm worried about the theological implications of this new body, what should I do? And it sort of encourages you to go speak to your um, local preacher or whoever um, is available to you. But I, I appreciated, and it, it doesn't give any answers, but I appreciate the fact that they acknowledge that this is something that some people might not be comfortable with, especially because they didn't know they would be getting entirely new bodies, they just thought they were getting organ donations, um, or organ, cloned organ transplant. Um, so John goes back to his room and, um, he looks at his eyes and he mentions that Kathy used to tell him that flecks of color in the iris are nothing more than additional fatty tissue and said that he had fat eyes. And this is just an, another one of probably a hundred more beats we will get in the story of Kathy being portrayed as this um, very human but still very ideal wife figure. Um, she, this is this is just an incredibly endearing little anecdote, um, and it also shows just how much John still misses her after eight years. Um, he looks at his body all over in the mirror. He has no hair other than the hair on his eyelashes and on the top of his head. So he probably can't even grow a mustache. Um, then he is greeted by his brain pal. Um, and this little dude is just charming. Um, he uses exclamation marks after every single sentence. And I also think that this exclamation marks after every single sentence is the pinnacle of comedy. I, this style is just hysterical to me. Um, I'm sure not everybody thought that, but it just kills me every time. Um, so, um, it train, it, it has him say a, a bunch of phrases and stuff to train it to understand what he's saying. Then he opts to turn off the voice and just have it appear as text in his vision. Um, and from this point on, I'm always a little bit annoyed um, because the text that the brain pal is saying actually shows up exactly like John's narration, which is kind of annoying. Um, you have to use your brain to figure out whether it's, um, whether it's the brain pal or the or, or John's narration, but Scal Scalzi is a skill enough, skilled enough writer that I'm never genuinely confused. I'm just worried that in the future there will be a couple of things that I genuinely don't know if it's asshole or John. Um, speaking of which, he names the uh, he names his brain pal asshole. So he says, "Hey asshole," to summon it, and "Go away asshole," to tell it to go away. Um, and it says, be aware that many recruits have selected this name for their brain pal. Would you like to choose a different name? And he says, no, I said, and was proud that so many of my fellow recru fellow recruits also felt this way about their brain pal. And, um, I don't know about the other recruits, but I know that when I name things, I like it to be something extremely unique that nobody else has. Um, and if somebody, and if my brain pal told me everybody else named it asshole, I would definitely change it to something else. But John is not like this. He values community and he values, um, 
knowing that the rest of his, the other recruits think the same way he does. Um, so it's just another character beat telling us about John. Um, he asks asshole a couple questions, and it gives him some canned answers. So it's not it's in it's fairly intelligent, but not that intelligent. Um, and after he's after he um, fiddles around with the functions of asshole for about an hour and a half, there's a knock at his door, and it's Jesse, and she jumps in, and not in the violent sense. In the in the other sense, and that's chapter five. This whole section of chapters four through six is a lot about the camaraderie between the old parts, but chapter six should probably have been titled "The Camaraderie Between the Old Parts," um, and that starts with the relationship between Jesse and John. I say the relationship, but it's there's nothing there. Um, the relationship between Jesse and John, but they're both part of the old parts, and then we get quite a bit of development in for the rest of them as well. Um, but most of that is off screen. Um, so Jesse and John have wild, repeated sex over the course of the next several hours, and um, they discuss the fact that they are just buck buddies, right? They're not trying to get into any kind of relationship, but they are just relieved to finally be able to actually have sex with another person um, with and, and be able to enjoy it with no setbacks. Um, they talk about the differences between their bodies now and the bodies that they had when they were actually 20. Um, and Interestingly, um, Jesse refers to her previous body as in real life, um, which is cute because this is real life. <laughs> it, it seems like a dream to them, but it's not. Um, after a couple more off-screen rounds of sex, um, John gets wistful and starts reminiscing about Kathy. And about how life was with her. And Jessie is a good sport about this. Like, she takes this about as well as any human being could um, or would. Um, she's in incredibly supportive about the fact that he wishes he was here with his wife, but she's dead. Um, and they get into the topic that um, John protested the subcontinental war. And I've been wondering about this the whole time, but apparently, um, apparently Kathy and John protested the subcontinental war because they, they didn't like that war in particular and they didn't want the United States Army to be involved. But Kathy believes, and she convinced John of this, that it's probably a nasty universe out there and and that people have the right to defend themselves. So, for one, we learn here that it's really Kathy who is making the moral and ethical decisions in this relationship. John went along with her because she convinced him. Um, but also that his anti-war sentiment was not nearly as intense as I thought. Yes, he had an intense anti-war sentiment, but it was about that particular war. He's not, he's not a hippie. Um, he's willing to, he's willing to justify violence if he believes it's justified. Um, we find out that they knew that they would be separated because they, um, they would be sorted separately. Um, but that she promised that she would find him again one day. Um, and with the knowledge that they would be going back to the colony after they serve um, to become members of this, these colonies. It is entirely possible that John and Kathy could have gotten married again and started maybe a, another family or become elders in their community. And um, knowing now that John will probably live an entire other century, um, it is especially sad that Kathy passed away when she did. Um, 
after this, Jesse and John reminisce on the fact that they both miss being married and they both miss just having somebody around at all times. Um, and it's bittersweet because spoilers for the rest of this chapter, but Jesse's a red herring. Um, they never have sex again. Uh, they don't get into any kind of permanent fuck buddy ship um, or even a casual relationship. In fact, Jesse is shipped off alone to another um, another station and will likely never see John again. Um, so Jesse was the first the first woman that we saw in this book other than the secretary. And um, she and John have had this rapport that is quite positive and um, and this sort of bittersweetness persists throughout the rest of the chapter, not just about Jesse but about the other friends that John had made along the way. Um, so then we skip ahead to the old farts eating dinner, um, now seeing each other as um, new people. And it says, uh, they all looked around the room. Uh, as I scanned the room, I couldn't find a single ugly human in it. It was pleasingly disturbing. And I, I laughed a little bit about this because this is, this is kind of, Maybe I'm imagining it, but this seems like it might be commentary on how in most science fiction books, and particularly in most fantasy, like fantasy is the worst rather, you've got, uh, and particularly YA fantasy, you've got a cast of dazzlingly attractive young people, and there are no ugly people, there are no older people, everybody is 15 to 25, and the most beautiful person of their race that anyone has ever seen. And um, that's just what this reminded me of. So now now we are in we are in stereotypical sci-fi land. Um, so um, the old farts talk about um, how they feel about being in their new body. And it's all very charming and characterful. Um, everybody responds to this to this situation in the way that their established character would respond. Um, their characters are all extremely consistent, even if they are simple. Um, Maggie, who speaks the least, says uh, that the reason that their bodies are all extremely attractive is because it's basic human psychology that we're inclined to like people who we find attractive, um, and that people who are attractive we trust more intrinsically, even if we aren't sexually attracted to them. Um, so this is our first real hint that Maggie is an anthropology-adjacent expert. Um, we find out later she studies um, Eastern religions or Eastern culture. I'll, I'll check it when we come up to it. Um, but she thinks about stuff like basic human psychology because that was her job. She was a professor in that for her entire life up until this point. Um, so yeah, we continue to characterize these people even though for most of them we probably won't see them after this chapter. Um, so then, uh, Harry, uh, sorry, Alan asks what they named their brain pals. Um, Alan named his dipshit, so it goes dipshit, asshole, bitch, dickwad, fuckhead, Satan, and sweetie. Uh, sweetie, says Susan. Apparently I'm the only one who likes my brain pal. So remember what I said about the comedic timing earlier and how, um, we have a setup, a pause that builds up the joke, and then a punchline, and that's how Scalzi is is handling this comedic timing. This is effectively the exact same joke as the Alan telling everybody he's gay, um, or, or same structure. It even looks the same on paper. It's like the same long line, a bunch of short lines, and then a longer line that is the punchline. Um, but it works. It's hilarious. Um, and I don't think it's going to get old, at least in this book. Now, all of John Scalzi's books have 15 of these jokes in them that all look the same. I'm sure it would get old. But right now, I'm loving it. Um, so they continue to talk about their how their psychology is being manipulated. And, um, and Harry says, um, these are crafty people we're dealing with. And I just put a note in here the first time I was reading this. It says, Harry is me. 
Perry is me last week when I was like, the CDF is going to eat their livers and this is all just a conspiracy to get elderly people livers on plates for the aliens. But um, So then uh, Lieutenant Colonel Brian Higgy shows up and tells them that they are, um, tells them they have a new mission and that he's their commanding officer. So for one, this is the first real CDF officer they have actually seen. We have entered a new era because these aren't people who have been hired by the CDF. This is a real CDF officer. Um, it says he looked all of 23 years old. Here's the thing. He's also green. It doesn't tell you that he's green, but he is. Because these guys are now used to people being green. Um, from here on out, unless they say, unless John says somebody is regular human color, assume that the people he meets are, are green because that's what people look like now um so yeah this lieutenant colonel brian hickey he's green um so the order that he gives them is to have fun um because they're in new bodies and they need to learn how to play ping pong with them they need to learn how to run again um i didn't mention this earlier but uh john still walks with a slouch because he's used to it but he needs to learn how to straighten up and walk like a young person again. Um, so their order is to ha have a week to get used to their new bodies as intensely as possible. And he warns them that this is probably the last time they will have pure, carefree fun for a long time. Um, John says everybody goes insane. Um, everybody is having sex on every possible surface, everywhere. Um, we find out that, um, yeah, Maggie was a professor at Oberlin College and she taught philosophy of Eastern religions. Um, this is really interesting because they are going to actually defend Eastern people and presumably their religions. So it's really easy to see why Maggie would be the opposite of Leon. Leon didn't think that Indian people were worth protecting. Maggie probably thinks that Indian people and their culture are extremely worth protecting. Um, it also turns out that she's been attracted to John the whole time, um, which may explain why she was quiet for most of the last several chapters. Um, but yeah. Um, so uh, the old farts pair up and have a lot of sex um, and play a bunch of ping pong, learn, watch other people do martial arts, um, it says that their hand-eye coordination was improved by the surgery, well, by the transfer. Um, so everything about them other than their memories has been significantly improved. Um, John downloads all of the cartoons of Wiley Coyote. Um, this was kind of weird, so I thought about it a little bit. Um, we go on for like quite a bit of time about how John has a nigh addiction to Wile E. Coyote for a couple of days. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but there's this list of rules for what each Wile E. Coyote cartoon can have in it. Um, running around the internet and um, some of the, most of the rules are stuff like no one can ever get permanently hurt. Um, and no, nothing truly evil ever occurs in Wile E. Coyote cartoons. And I think that's why John liked it. Um, so, uh, John says that he becomes incredibly close to all the old farts. He says that he's as close to them as he's ever been to anyone else. And, um, and he says that he knows he's going to miss them because they're getting separated. So, um, Lieutenant Colonel Higgy tells him at the end of the week that 75% uh, of them will die in the 10 years that they are going to be serving. He says that most of them will actually serve for 10 years instead of the two that they were told that they would probably be serving, or that they assumed they would be serving. Um, and he tells them that in this universe, they are... In this universe, there are hundreds of other races that are vying for every habitable planet 
every time the humans come across something that they can can't terraform easily or they can just live on, they will either ask for permission to live there with whoever's living there. And if the, those people say no, they kill them all. Um, it's a kill or be killed kind of world. Um, I personally think of a utopian future as being like the um, Mos Eisley Cantina from Star Wars, where there's there's ten bar stools and seven of, and there are seven different races sitting on them, and there's conflict between the different people individually, but there's not. But most people aren't super concerned with race conflict. That's not what the world looks like in this book. Um, everybody's at roughly the same level of technological advancement, and so they are just one up in each other at the fastest possible rate. And it's it's kind of sad for those of us who like Star Trek and want there to be a united federation of planets. But right now, no one is stepping up and saying, we want there to be a federation. And um, it says humanity has few allies among the sentient races. I guess the Gehar are one of them, that species that we saw earlier in the book. Um, but there's, but that's it. Um, Lieutenant Higgy says, it is regrettable when this happens, but the needs of humanity are and must be our priority. And, um, but he says that as payment for probably working incredibly hard to fight these aliens every day, they will be given another chance at life starting over, uh, potentially starting a new family on a new planet. Um, I'm not sure whether John will take this. Uh, he, m most of these recruits probably think that they, they already lived a life. Why would they want to start over? Um, in fact, Higgy says that m most recruits go back and serve another term of 10 years or more. Um, but this is what, this is what humanity has to do in this world. And it's, it's actually fairly sad. Um, it's bittersweet, like I said. Um, so the old farts find out that they're being split up. Harry and Susan are reporting to Alpha Base, Jesse to Beta, Maggie and Thomas to Gamma, and Alan and I, are, Alan and John are going to Delta. So, in in case you weren't keeping her tra keeping track of this, no one who was friends or fuck buddies or roommates is together. Harry and Susan have basically never interacted. Jesse is with nobody. Maggie and Thomas have never interacted, and Alan and John have never interacted either. So they're all they're all going with somebody that they don't even that they're the least close to, um, and it stinks, but they promise that they're going to write to each other. So it's like I said in the last podcast, there must be a way for these people to communicate, and they, they promise that they will. Even if it takes years for them to get these letters, they are going to, they're going to communicate with each other as much as they can. So they, they vow to continue to be friends, and it's, it's bitter, but it's, it's sweet. Um, so they it says they stay together as long as they could and that's the end of part one um so from this point on we're, we're in rising action we're in conflict um up to this point there's been character building but no real plot per se um so yeah i look forward to where this is going because i genuinely don't know uh, we know that john is actually okay with some levels of violence and that he's become a stronger person in this time. Um, and we don't know what he's going to be asked to do, but we know we have a good, we have a pretty good idea at this point. Um, so I'm, I'm completely, I don't know. So the discussion question for this week is how far do you think human, humanity should go to ensure peace? in the galaxy. Um, and by that I mean, how hard do you think humanity should try to make peace with these people? Um, at what point do we say, you know what, we're gonna nuke this planet. So let me know in the comments below or in, or in Reddit, um, and I'll read your response next week. Till next time.